Hello, this is Claudia Phylos with the Center for Linux Studies, and I'm delighted to be here today with Susan Edmonds, who is joining us to talk about uh, weavers as heroes, and I would like to also welcome the members of our Hour 25 and Heroes X community. Thank you all for joining us. Great. Um, Susan, before we get started, I just want to share a little bit about your bio with our community. Um, because I'm very excited to share this information because I, you have a little bit of uh, a more, very exciting background. I want to let everyone know that you actually studied classics at Harvard as an undergraduate and as a graduate, and I you did. wrote a, a very beautiful dissertation. It's called Homeric Nepios, uh, which was published as part of the Harvard Dissertations in Classics series. I've read it. It's absolutely gorgeous, and as any Heroes X community members know, um, your work on Napios has been so important to our conversations and our community. So I encourage people to um, learn more about that. But uh, even before you finish your degree, you felt like you had a kind of a different calling. Um, and I think you were, you say you were more drawn to the physical world. So That's, uh, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Um, however, your husband did go on. Uh, Lowell Edmonds was a very distinguished uh, classics professor at Rutgers. He's retired now. You also have two daughters and six beautiful grandchildren. <laughs> Um, you've held a variety of different positions, but among them you've had a research position at Johns Hopkins Medical School. Um, it was not a research. No, it was not. It was specifically not research. Oh, sorry, sorry. It, it was, it was, it was, that's where I began to call myself a clinical philologist. Right, okay. Uh, I was, it, was a, it was an editorial position. Okay, right. Oh, sorry, I misread that. I, I apologize. Yeah. Um, and so... But eventually, you did leave that workplace, and you took up weaving, and it took up more of your time. Um, and one of the projects you have done, it was a co-production with Prudence Jones and Alex Marek. Uh, Allison Marek, am I saying Allison that Marek was the, was the videographer, yes. Great. Uh, and you produced a beautiful video that was very important to my own career path, and it's called Text and Textile, an Introduction to Woolworking for Readers of Greek and Latin. That's available online um, through YouTube, and we can point the community towards that. And even more recently, you contributed an essay to the Fest Trip by Gregory Nash entitled Picturing Homeric Weaving. Uh, in which you looked at the mechanics of warp-weighted looms. And so we're so delighted to have you join us today to talk to us about Weavers as Heroes. Um, and it's just a pleasure to, to speak with you here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. And, and it's, it's a pleasure for me to be here, too. And, and always a pleasure to go back to, um, to ancient, to, well, to classics, really, right. because, because I enjoyed my study of classics a lot, but I, I knew I didn't have the temperament of a scholar, and so, and, I, and, I, and I've never had any real regrets, but it's always nice to revisit these, um, and, and, and once, I had, once I had learned about weaving, and I, I learned, and through Greg, I learned how much, how important weaving had been, was in the history of, of Greek uh, poetry, and so, so that, so there seemed to be a purpose for, for writing something about weaving for classicists who might not, you know, if you have a metaphor that, um, I mean, for the Greeks, the metaphor is um, you take something that's familiar to, to illustrate something that is not so familiar or that you want to make a point about. Right. And, um, but the, 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 our familiarity is reversed. We're much more familiar with Greek poetry in general, than we are with Greek weaving. So I, I wanted to illustrate um, um, Greek weaving, and that's why I called that piece um, Picturing Homeric Weaving. Um, so um, so let's, yeah. let's talk about that metaphor, right? Because I know you have been inspired by Greg's work on weaving and poetry, and I think what he has shown uh, is that weaving is really a metaphor for the creation of poetic texts, right? That's one of the things. That's right. That's right. And and um, the more I look at it, the more I find it not so immediately obvious what that means. And I haven't looked at it deeply. And I did. I did want to say, you know, that I'm 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 not a scholar, and I don't keep up with what's going on in classics. So there may be some of you who can set me straight on certain things or add something that I will not have thought of. For one thing, I know that there's a lot of Work that's been done on um, women's lives in antiquity, and and I I want to speak a little about a little bit about that in thinking of the weaver as a, as the heroic status of the weaver, but um, there may be things that I I don't know about that, that I'd like right. to hear about. 
Well, what I'm so delighted about is the way that you're going to take what is so unfamiliar to us, which is the process of weaving, and help us get a little more familiar with it. So do you want to just kind of take us into this idea of the Weaver as Hero? Sure. Um, it, let, me, let me just start with um, there, a passage that – there's a passage in which um, – in the in Iliad six, when Hector comes to Andromache, and he says, um, he says to her after they've had this this very um, moving conversation, um, but now you go back to your weaving, and and I'll go do I'll go back to to the battlefield, which is the work of men, and and especially in the context of this this kind of tender domesticity between Hector and Andromache, it almost sounds like a dismissal. Um, just don't bother your pretty head about, about war, don't worry, be comfortable. But that is an unusual um, portrayal, really. And, and a more, you know, if you then look at, the, at, at when Iris comes to Helen, and and I forget which, which book that is, but but she anyway she's um, she um, is disguised as as a, a sister-in-law of Helen, and she um, and she finds Helen sitting and weaving, and it looks like she's sitting by herself, but she probably would have had women around her helping her, but she's weaving the story of the Trojan War basically. So her weaving. Her task is the same as the task of the poet of the Iliad, that is the story of the Trojan War, and um, that's a serious endeavor because it has to do with the fame of of the heroes on the battlefield, but it also is a very high status kind of activity um, to weave um, to weave um, um, pictorial weaving. It takes a lot of education, and I want to speak in time um, a little bit later about this um, education of the weaver. But it also takes a lot of it takes leisure. It takes the support of many servants because Helen, who if she's if she is weaving the picture of the Trojan War, she is not um, she is not um, also spinning all her all her yarn or dyeing all her yarn or um, doing all this preparatory work that that is necessary for a weaver. Um, she is she is the, the very highly skilled master weaver who knows how to do this this pictorial weaving. And um, one of the interesting things, I mean there are so many layers of course in the Homeric poems, but but in um, in the Bronze Age as as the the um, there were three major there was a lot of trade in the throughout the Mediterranean of course and um, there were three major um, categories of trade goods uh, one was elite you know prestige trade goods one was um, gold one was silver and of course things worked in those metals and one was textiles and the textiles um, in Knossos for instance there was a great uh, palace um, um, textile production workshop, and and the same in Cyprus and 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 other places. And these textiles went all over the the Mediterranean. They've been found in places in southern Russia, and and not the not Bronze Age textiles, I don't think, but um, but but somewhat later. But but they did. But we know they traveled far, and. Um, and well, you see it in the Odyssey too. That when when Odysseus is given gifts, he's given he's given gold and he's given silver and he's given um, robes and 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 those robes would be uh, would be, probably be pictorial, you know. Um, and um, now the when the Homeric poems that as we have them were being formed and coming into the into the kind of form that somehow got written down and that we we tend to have that was that was a, a long time ago the bronze age was a long time ago and the um elizabeth barber who wrote this wonderful book um several wonderful books but she wrote prehistoric textiles which is is a magnificent um it's full of information it's it's wonderful but she suggests and i love this suggestion that during the time 
of the Homeric, that the Homeric poems were coming, were coming together as poetry, as poems, that we, as we know them, um, some, of the, some of those textiles or fragments of those textiles, which would have been hundreds of years old, could still have been around in, um, in you know, chests, you know, if you think of the storeroom that, 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 um, that Hecuba goes to, that's um, um, in the centermost part of the palace, and, it's, and there's cedar around it. And she, by the way, is looking at textiles. Her finest textiles were woven not by herself, but by uh, women of Sidon. So that's an example of the textile trade and the, the collection of, of um, these prestige textiles, which is a little bit different picture from the picture of, of um, Andromache or Helen or Penelope doing their own weaving in their own palaces and more or less for their own purposes, so it seems. Um, although the, the, um, we know that when cities were sacked, what was taken was, uh, of course, anything valuable and portable, but especially the women and, and the, children, the young children. Um, and the women were taken to, to be weavers in other people's workshops because, because it's very labor intensive and, and the textiles are very valuable. Um, so, but okay, go back to the, to the hero. Um, let me pause myself for a moment and, and try to get, get well, it's actually what I really want to go back to, and this is part of the heroic part too, is is music, yeah. because and and song. So there's there there is a tradition. I think it's when um, Odysseus comes to uh, Circe's um, house. Um, she is heard um, singing as she weaves, and there are other references to singing while weaving. Um, there's there's been a suggestion, and I'm sorry, I don't remember the author's, uh, his name is Tony something or other, um, who wrote uh, about um, what were they singing and suggested perhaps they were singing the, um, they were singing things that reminded them how to weave what they were weaving, which I don't think is probably the case, although they may have been singing things that inspired their weaving or things that were, you know, traditional songs that went along with the activity of weaving. And there are examples of that in, in other cultures. And um, now I want to look at my, my list of pictures. Okay, let's look, let's look if we can at the, met, the vase from the Metropolitan Museum that has, um, has two women working at a loom. And um, obviously they if they're not singing, they are telling stories. Is there a way to make to make that bigger? It's very it could, yes. I think it can be made a little bit yeah. bigger. Yeah. Um, um, well, Sarah's in, working in on any, that. Yeah. In any case, you can see you can see the 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 basic structure of the loom, which is is something like a letter H with a with a top um, with a top on it. And that dark line, yes, at the top is the rolled up cloth that has already been woven. And, and there are two women there and um, they are actively weaving and there are things going off from the side which are, um, are roll um, bobbins with, with wool one um, wrapped around them. And then they, uh, the one on the left is, is um, beating upwards with, with a stick to either strumming the warp or, or beating in the weft, and I will show you that. Um, in fact, maybe we could go to this now, which is the first little video um, of me weaving at the loom, which is now behind me. Yes. Um, yeah, and I mean, I what? love that. I know Sarah's gonna. It's gonna take just a second to bring sure, that up. Sure, it's gonna take a minute, um, because because. Um, oops, and now it's. it's it will on. come. Yeah, it oh, will it come. It will come. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, the. 
the act if you see the activity of weaving and and really the the um, the sound did not come through well in this video and and the sounds of my loom are going to be very different from the sound of somebody else's loom well maybe we'll just have to turn our heads on the side is it is it on its side for everybody oh uh, I don't see it yet oh does is anyone else seeing the picture yet oh no okay it sounds like she's having trouble rotating it. I wonder if I can bring it up, okay? So for let's pause. Um, okay. So Sarah can stop trying to share, and I'll try and share, okay? Okay. Okay. So I'm going to okay. shut off my camera for a second while I do that, but I can hear you. Okay. Okay. And so while um, while, the, while that's happening, I'll just I'll just mention there are various things that can make sounds in weaving. One is the is the um, the the beater, and I have a little beater with me here, which maybe I'll show you when I have I'm fully on screen but there's a you're beating the weft up and then to, in order for that weft to become um, straight you strum across and the vibration of the strings brings the the weft um, into place and um, then um, the shifting of the uh, of the uh, of the sheds can cause the the loom weights to to clink together. Now mine mine are, are made of metal washers and so they actually clink, but um, if they were made of clay, they would have a more um, a more um, sound like a wooden chime or a you know clink um, clay things clunking together. Anyway, it would be it could but it could be a rather musical sound and they might be of different sizes and have somewhat different different tones to them. So Susan, um, I think I can share that. Can we okay, share that little okay. video clip? Okay. Sure. So I'm going to turn on um, my video now, and then I'm going to screen share in just one second. Okay. okay. As we pull that up. Oh dear. So it's interesting. I think we're having some oh. technical difficulties. Say screen share doesn't seem to want to work for me today. Oh, that's that's. I'm too getting bad. no reaction. So here's what we'll do. Um, can we post that video, Susan? Yes. Why don't you do that? That's that's a good idea. Okay. And 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 the other one too. I mean, they're not they're not yeah. of critical importance. But I just thought it would be interesting. Um, it's interesting to see how sounds might be made, and it also gives a little sense. If you see the weaving process in motion, it gives you a little more sense of of um, of how it's done. Um, and uh, some. It's often been said that the warp weighted loom, which which was the the loom all throughout Europe in Neolithic times, um, was a you know a, a poor invention of the poor people of olden times who um, didn't have the technical expertise that came later, and actually it is a very good tool I find. But <laughs> um, one of the things that people say is well you have to stand up to weave at it but actually it's quite a bit more comfortable to stand up if you're weaving all day and also to walk back and forth at your loom than it is to um, to um, sit um, where there's a, there's even a, a, a um, I have a brother who's an orthopedic surgeon and there's a, a kind of something that can happen to your sit bones if you are uh, uh, that has to the name of it's called weavers sit bones or whatever. <laughs> um, so anyway, um, and, and the other thing about the warp weighted loom, for if any of you have tried weaving, you will know that, um, that it, if you, you have to be careful how many things you put, how many different sizes of weft you put in because you can mess up the tension and there always has to be even tension on, on the warps. But with the warp, weight, with the warp weighted situation, everything is flexible. Because the it's not if the weft warps are attached to a bar, then you have to reattach them, or you have to tighten the ones, find some way to tighten the ones that are loose. But with the, the warp weighted, the warps just float in the air, <clears throat> excuse me, and adjust automatically. So the so the warp weighted loom is a great tool. Um, but I want to go back now to to this um, business of music. Um, and sorry, I just um, I don't. Um, That's fine. Yes, take okay. your time to find that okay. note. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Thank you. I mean, um, while you're looking oh, for that, can I just add one of the things that sure, was so sure. beautiful for me? Um, 
it, no, please keep looking. Uh, yeah. you can look for your note. Is okay. that um, when I saw your video and thinking about the musicality, that was really the first time I really understood the connection between the weaver working and maybe the sound of a bird. Uh, because what I saw you doing is, and I could see the, the loom behind you, right? Uh -huh. So imagine you're standing in front of that loom and you're working and you pull the string across, the uh -huh. left across, and you tap, 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 tap it up, and then you strum it across. Yes. Right? And when you think about the nightingale, it's that chirp, 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 chirp. It's, 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 it is, yes, it's, it, it's not a loud sound, but if you think of, of the, the voices of cicadas being described as lily-like, yeah. um, maybe cicadas sounded very different in yeah. ancient Greece, but the, the, their lily-like voices, we wouldn't, I don't think we would, the metaphor, that, that simile would be quite the same for us. The cicadas that we hear, we wouldn't say are lily-like. And I've heard cicadas in Athens, and they sound different from the ones here, but it's still a kind of vibrating noise. And and um, I think that vibrating noise it may have sounded more like a musical noise in a culture where musical instruments were didn't have metal strings and and um, maybe uh, flutes were made of wood and so that there's a kind of breathiness to it. Um, um, I think Janet may be able to screen share. Janet, can you? So she might pull it up for us. Okay. It seems to be working for her. Google Hangout has That's been it. having some trouble over the last few days, so I'm going to present her screen to everybody. Okay, that, that, looks, that looks promising. Yeah, here we go. So we're going to see this in action. Okay, so here I come. Oh, I'm glad to see this because what I have, what I have in my hand there, my left hand, is um, holding the, the, the um, warp open. And um, it's the, 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 the weaving rod in that simile with the, um, actually, let me, let me come back to that because I want to say there I'm positioning the, the weft. Um, I, I'm not a skilled warp weighted loom weaver, so I don't go quickly. There I'm opening the counter shed, and, and with that rod I beat up the, straighten out the weft slightly. Now I'm passing the, the weft and through the shed, bringing it up, making sure I have it more or less in the right place. And um, and then I'm, oh, I didn't even get to beat it in, beat that one in. I, I shortened this, this video a little much. Maybe you could, can, um, Janet, if you can start the other video then we can just finish that um, that little thought and um, the um, but the it, there's a passage in the Iliad that says um, that I think it's when there's a, a running race and Odysseus comes just as close to someone else as the weaver um, brings the the canon or weaving rod to her chest so it's the, the distance of the the weaving rod to the, the weaver's chest. So, so I, I was passing the weft, and then I don't know if this is coming, if you can see this, what I'm doing, and then bringing it close to me so that I could then pass. Um, I mean, I'm opening the shed, bringing it close to me, and passing the weft through. Um, and that, um, so that, that's what that, that um, image is. It's, it's that flexible rod the rod that the weaver has to um, to hold the shed open and then and then um, um, bring it to her. I don't know. I don't want to go into a lot of the technical detail of weaving. It is in the, sure, sure. because it's it's hard to explain. I don't want to try to explain everything because it's 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 too much. That's why I made these little videos to just sort of see it and um, and but. Meanwhile, I'll keep talking about the the um, musicality because there's also something about um, about what is woven and how it is composed. So, um, and we don't have we don't have a, we have almost no ancient Greek weaving. Um, at, nothing from 
the Bronze Age, as far as I know. And it, but but there are pictures um, in um, say on on vase painting and on um, the walls in Knossos and so forth. Um, and 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 later pic later pictures, especially on vase painting, that show weaving made done in <clears throat> in strips. So a picture is told in a strip, almost like a comic strip. So um, I mean, a, a story is told in a on weaving in a kind of strip of of um, of little pictures, and and the the weaver does not see very much on the on the um, of the weft as she's of the, of the of what she's woven as she's weaving it. It's not like the Renaissance tapestries where you have one big picture that includes many things happening and it has the cinematic quality. This um, the 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 um, ancient Greek weaver weaving a story would be weaving a story in strips, and um, and so these strips have a kind of rhythm and then there are decorative elements along with them. Um, and there are, um, and there's a kind of musical rhythm to, to the, um, to the juxtapositions of these different things. And, and there, I want to make a comparison and I make this comparison also in, um, in, um, picturing Homeric weaving, uh, with the weaving in the high Andes of Peru. Because um, it's it's in some ways a similar weaving tradition. It was a very very highly developed um, in pre-Columbian times, very very highly developed weaverly tradition, and there were palace workshops and uh, weaving was was um, textiles were prestige trade goods, the prestige trade goods, and um, they didn't even I don't know if they had gold much gold and silver, but I but textiles were extremely important. And um, and but it's different from um, ancient Greece. One because we have a, a lot of it has survived because the air is so dry, and um, and the tradition has survived because the same people have been living there and in in very remote places. So so. Um, there was a, a musician, I, I'm not even sure, John Cohen, I'm not even sure if he's still alive, but a, a musician in the 60s, 50s, 60s, um, and he um, is, was also a photographer, or is a photographer, and when, when he was young, I think this was in the, this was in the 1950s, he was, he was writing, he was doing a school paper, or it may have been a, a graduate school paper on pre-Columbian textiles and he went to the Brooklyn Museum and he saw this um, a, a textile and he looked at it and I, I just want to read this read what he said about it um, if I which I thought I had written down um, um, he said standing standing before a beautiful Paracas textile I wondered why the weaver had used a specific sequence of colors and why there were random interruptions to these patterns the color series resembled music to me. Three months later, I was on my way to Peru. And he has this, um, he, he um, published these, uh, a lot of these photographs in, in uh, various places, but, but the, the book that I have, that he, he, well, I have two books that he worked on. One, one is um, called There Is No I. And now if we could bring up, um, the first of the um, John Cohen photos, the um, blessing the warp. Do we? Can we bring that up, Sarah? Yeah. No, that's actually that's that's the actually that's the first photo. It's this one. Okay, it's this one. So this um, now these looms are backstrap looms. Um, Different from the looms that were used in ancient Greece, and this, and now, but the loom is here laid out, and this woman is blessing the um, the the warp with a with I think it's corn beer. But what I wanted to point out, and I don't know if you can see in this little tiny photograph, um, at least it's tiny on my screen, but the there's a, a white implement um, right in front of her left hand, 
and it's um, yes, we can see that. That's it. That's it. Okay, and it's a. It looks like a piece of bone, but it's um, it's pointed, and that is what that is analogous to what the uh, is called the kerkis in in um, descriptions of ancient Greek weaving, and I just call it a kerkis because well, it's translated pin beater, and then Greg came up with a, a, a more elegant. Um, expression name for it and I'm forgetting it at the moment but I think it's a weaving pin a weaving pin okay but but often like it's, translated, pin, it's often I translated think, as shuttle right which which you make the point that it's that's not. right it's not a shuttle because the shuttle is what carries the um, is what carries the weft and um, but I think it's well I don't know why it's thought of I don't know why it's translated as a shuttle but um, it's definitely not a shuttle it's um, this pin beater is something that um, let's go to the next uh, picture in the series, um, the the photograph. Um, there's another picture of the of the pin beater. Um, the, the pin beater is uh, I was using this little um, um, tapestry bobbin. Um, okay, so I'm going to first. I don't know if you can see in front of my face. I'm holding up this tapestry bobbin, but it's pointed, and now this hold on, hold on. Week, I can switch to you, Susan. I can switch you for one second. Okay, okay. This is this is what I used. Um, can you hold that a little bit higher? Okay. There you go. Can you see it? Okay. Higher. Yes, higher. 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 There you go. Okay. Thank you. So now I can see that that um, my face is not must not be centered, but um, yes. Okay. This is a tapestry bobbin, and the it's called a, the bobbin. It, when you're doing tapestry, you have the weft wound around this part of it. Um, but the, the ancient Greeks used, uh, seem to have used um, a bobbin which would be a, a stick and may have been the spindle that the, the, the yarn was, was spun on. And, and you can see that in the metropolitan vase. There are several of those kind of stuck into the, into the loom. But here, okay, here, now she has a needle um, in front of her. And the needle is for, this, the, the, is for finishing the weaving because because on a backstrap loom you weave from um, you weave up half of the weaving and then you turn it all, turn it around because you can't reach um, as far you can roll it up too but but in any case and they have what's called four selvage weaving so that there's no um, fringe on the top or the bottom and no hem it's just woven with four completed selvages but it does mean that the last few pieces have to um, Last few wefts that go through have to be done with a needle, and but beside the needle, now this is a, a, an even better picture of this this uh, pin beater that she has. And I think I like the reason the reason I like the word pin beater better than than weaving pin is because it is um, it describes the beating aspect of it. So so in the second of the little videos that I made, I. Um, I did a very simple pattern, basically just um, a stripe across, an interrupted stripe across the the warp, and um, with my this little um, bobbin with its pointy end, I'm picking up the the warps to get um, the weft in the right place. And and I, I think um, Janet may be able to share that. Now. Can you pull that up? Yes. Okay, let's give it another try. Okay. This is yeah. This is the one. Good. So so there I'm picking I'm picking up you know every two um, the warps in pairs. Um, I go over four and then pick up two, then over two and pick up another two over four. And so um, especially with fine threads, it's it's very difficult to do this with your fingers because um, because the thread is so is is fine and, and you can't distinguish but with this little very pointed thing it, it, it works um, it works quite well and then you should see me now beat it up um, after I straighten out my slowness here gives you some indication of the difficulty because well these little warps are not um, they were just set up for experiments but the heading bands are not very good okay there I'm, I'm I Okay, that's that. That's the end. <laughs> um, 
I trimmed it a little more than I had intended to trim it, but um, but the um, the beat, the beating up is important, and then and then the strumming. And I think the other little video shows that a bit. Um, but um, to go back, can we go now um, back to uh, the last of the three John Cohen photographs, which is near Pisac, Peru. That's the title of it. Okay. Now, oops, not that. The pre that one, yes. Now, I don't know if you can see here. It's very small on my screen. But there's a, um, a woman sitting with her backstrap loom at the top. Um, and then in the middle, there is a child, I don't know, three or four years old, and she has a little bit of fluff in her hands. And she is... Um, very her the, if you can see the profile of her face she's obviously very intent on whatever it is she's doing and the then the baby who's sitting you know down at the low in the lower part of the who's lying down wrapped in in quite lovely textiles has a string that's tied between her two fingers and she's holding it apart and she's and there's eye contact between the mother and the baby um, and th so the baby is being trained in in these textile skills from from the cradle, literally. Um, and and both of these children are spending their days with their mother while she weaves, and of course does other things. But um, there, this was this photograph was taken, I think, in the 19, early 1950s. But even now, I, in, in picturing Homeric weaving, I quote from, from somebody named Gary Urton, who I think is at Harvard, and he is an ethno-mathematician and spent, um, I think, maybe about a year in the highlands of Bolivia in a, in a kind of remote weaving community where um, women are, are weavers. They weave on backstrap looms. They weave um, very traditional weavings and he apprenticed himself to, he wanted to to learn to do this weaving so he could analyze the, the mathematics of it um, and he found that he had to work with a 12 year old girl because she was she was um, able to teach him because she was a beginner now that but but he said the children starting awesome. from starting from when they're toddlers they start um, they start weaving things. They notice their, their mothers doing it, they notice their older siblings doing it, and they, they vie with one another to, to create little weavings. And then, um, then the girls, when they're in early adolescence, they, they start being formally trained. And um, so he was, his, his main teacher, um, was, and he said it took him, you know, by the, time, by the end of his, his course, which might have been a semester or two semesters, um, he could do he could weave the simplest of these little um, um, passages that 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 the um, that the, the the young girls learn to weave. They, in other words, they learn to weave. Not I mean, if now when a tapestry tapestry weaver is trained, she's trained or he to um, to weave shapes. So you learn to weave a circle. You learn to weave a a um, uh, a diagonal line, different kinds of diagonals. You learn to weave, to mix colors, but but in these traditional communities, people learned motifs, and it's so it's a lot like formulas in um, in that's amazing uh, um, Homeric well, poetry. Like, like like with uh, we've been reading the Singer of Tales and how they learn how to, how to put these phrases together uh, and the stories. They don't start with a word they start with those those phrases if you like exactly just, just, yeah. yes yes they 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 um they start with the phrases and these these motifs or phrases of these weaving passages are um are in a in a in a master weaving they're combined and so that but the children start by learning learning um um, a single motif, and now maybe we could. I don't know if, if you can. You bring up the passage from from Euripides. Um, 
or shall I, I can just, um, I could read it or I could, um, I don't have it written. Okay, I, we may... No, I can, re I can read it. Don't worry, don't bring it up. Don't bring okay. it up. It's but more also, fun to in read. a second, I'd like to open this. Oh, Sarah has it. And I'd also, after this, like to open this up for questions, because I know our community members here might have some questions, okay? Oh, oh sure, yes, oh, sure, yes. Sure. Um, I want to finish one thought though. Okay, here here it is. So so look for a piece of weaving which I did when I when I was a child. There's there's a the the situation is um it's an identification. So there's this chest that um, has tokens by which Ion will learn who his mother is. Um, and so what young girls do a lot of what sort of weaving? Young girls do a lot of weaving. And she remembers, she says, it's incomplete, it's a sample from the pin beater, from the Kerkis, a sample from the Kerkis. So in other words, she was learning to use the, her Kerkis to do this pictorial weaving. And, um, well, you can read it because it's there on your screen. <laughs> um, but, and what she's weaving is not a complete picture. It's not um, like what my grandchildren want to weave, which is a complete picture. No, she's weaving a gorgon, um, and it's a gorgon. Now, if has everybody finished reading this passage describing her the girlish work of my loom? Yes, um, yes, it's beautiful. And um, I just happen to have in this coloring book of of Greek weaving a nice picture of a gorgon. Um, does that come through? It does. Can you hold it up a little bit higher? Maybe even a little bit higher. That's a dazzling, right? Yes. Wow. Dazzling. So probably it would have been the Gorgon's head that she that she she wove, and and now um, I don't know if it's necessary to to because these the pictures are a little clunky. But I had, I mean, it's bring it takes time to bring up the pictures, and I don't want to take time to show that little fish that oh, no, came on the screen for a moment. And that was that was a child's weaving, and um, and it's it, um, anyway. Let's let's not do, let's not do that. We can do it later if um, there it is. Okay, there's a, and can you scroll down through that? No, you can't because you um, okay. No, it's not on that. It's not on that page. So so so. This is um, a present-day weaver who's the, the daughter of weavers and in a weaving family, and Yadine La Rochette is her name, and she wove this when she was seven years old. And then she shows in um, in a blog, which I think I might have sent a link to, but I'm not sure. It's but don't bring it up because it, it's a, some finished. You will hear it is that you. You're, this is great. Can you scroll down now? Okay, this is a picture of Yadin weaving, and then go keep going down, and uh, keep going down past the beautiful Aubusson, um village. Keep going down, and go, go down. You'll go down past. You'll see the picture of the little fish there. And now below is the fish. She's working on this series of uh, fish. Um, which has it's a much more grown-up idea, the fish in the can, and um, and um, but it's the the refinement in that picture and the the um, less refinement, in, but but still great skill in the the seven-year-old child picture um, that um, that I I wanted I wanted to show, um, and. The other point, I, just to go back for a moment to the to these Bolivian, these because this this it's coming full circle to to the um, um, to the idea of the weaver as hero. When Gary Erdin was in, he spent this year in this um, community of weavers, and um, the the master weavers were. Um, not only produced this the, the most elegant weaving, but they would also set up the warps for um, for other weavers, um, because and that and with especially with the um, the um, the weaving that they do is because of the the backstrap loom, it's it's warp faced, 
and it's a little bit of a different technique. So a lot of the patterning is is in the making of the, the putting together of the warp, and so it takes um, to do that structure um, is um, is the is the very important thing, and it takes a lot of mathematical skill and also aesthetic, you know, a lot of good of taste to set up that structure in which the the weaving can take place. So there again, there's there's it's something like the structure of poetry, and and each of the each of these weavings um, is different from each other one. There are no they're they're never the same. They're like like the spoken word. I mean, each weaver will has her own taste and her own thing. But the structure to have this framework. So, so I think you know to have the have um, Greg used the the uh, made the analogy between the heading band, which is which sets up the the warp for the on the warp weighted loom. The heading band is like the proemion of of a of a poem. Which, because it sets up the structure for the for the whole rest of it to happen, but in addition, the the um, these master weavers would who would set up the warp for other women were also consulted in the community about all kinds of things. Any problem that would come up, people would go to them because they were masterful. <laughs> um, and and so I think that the 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 head. Of you know the the the, the Penelope of a of a workshop um, would have great prestige in her community simply by being the one who knew um, how to make these things happen and 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 when Penelope for instance in the Odyssey when when um, I know in the Iliad when Odysseus is um, it men it's mentioned that Odysseus and Menelaus go to Troy to try to negotiate. The um, the release of of Helen before you know, before they decide to, to fight they um, they weave a, they weave a great stratagem and a, a web uh, they weave a great they, they uh, I forget exactly how it goes but but the they the, they put together a stratagem that creates a great web um, and you could read that as like a spider creates a web in which their enemies will be caught, but I don't think that's what it is. I think what it is is they they construct a complex situation, which if everything is followed the way and it goes the way it should down through the warp, then Helen the negotiation will be successful and Helen will will um, be returned. Um, so so. It's the it's the wisdom, the generalized wisdom and and um, problem solving skills of the of the weaver that that I that makes me think of is a strong heroic quality. Um, so yeah, anyway, I see, him, yeah. I see him, and I mean it's so beautiful. This this idea of having to look ahead, right, to see ahead to what is what the outcome will be. That's I mean, right. That's dazzling. right. Let's see what yes. Helen. I think Helen has a question here. Okay. First, thank you so much for this very interesting presentation because I don't know much about weaving and I've, I learn a lot, you know, and this is very interesting. Uh, I just have, mo it's more a comment than a question. It's, it's about Helen. Helen is a woman who gets her class on her, on her own mm -hmm. without getting it from a man. So she's a very interesting character in the Iliad. And she's the first woman to speak in the Iliad, in, sc in Scroll 3. She doesn't speak at the beginning, but she speaks in Scroll 3, as you showed. And she's also the last woman who speaks in Scroll 24. So she, I think she's, she plays an interesting part into the epic narration. And in Scroll 3, as you showed, she's weaving she is weaving the stories of the Achaeans and the Trojans, and she's telling the story of the Iliad through the means of weaving. Yes. So, what can you tell us a little bit about this type of epic narration um, through her weaving? I'm wondering if she's not telling the whole story, and we know already 
about it in the book three, that she's weaving the story. She's weaving it as it happens. Um, it's, um, it, well, for one thing, I think that it, it puts her, it, it, it's, it's, um, it puts her in the role of the poet. It puts her in the role of, um, so it, there's, there's that, that deeper connection between weaving and song. It's not, it's not just a kind of visual metaphor. It's also the metaphor of, of construction, of choosing what should be there, of, of fitting, taking the motifs that you know and, and linking them together to make a whole new story. Um, and, Yes, and she defines she you know it is all about her. It's not she's not a character like like um, Chryseis in the um, who is being fought over um, by but, but she's passive and she doesn't she doesn't do anything. It's just that the men like her and she's their prize and. Um, or, or it's when I guess it's when Achille, I mean it's the, those two women, Chryseis and Briseis, if I'm getting their names right, and they're um, and and Achilles and Agamemnon are fighting over them, and um, and it's interesting that 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 Achille, um, Agamemnon says I like her I like her better than my wife um, because she's she is tall and shapely and she has a good mind. And because of her erga, because of her weaving skill, um, which I have to tell the story because Amazing. in the beginning of the, the 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 war in Afghanistan, I heard a reporter talking to two boys, and um, two Afghan boys through an interpreter, obviously, and asking them, you know, do they like girls? Are they interested in girls? Of course, and. Um, and what do they look for? And one of them said, oh, a, a beautiful woman, of course. And the, and the other one said, yes, yes, beautiful, unless she's a really good weaver. Um, and and that would, it would make up for a, a lack of beauty if she, or if she were a, ru a rug weaver, I think he said, if she were a rug weaver. And that this sounded just like what Agamemnon was saying to me. Yes, she's she's good looking and and she's smart, but but she's a really good weaver. Um, That's amazing. You know, I see Bill has a question. Can we take that? Sure. Um, I just wanted to follow up on on Helen's comments before I ask my question. Sure. I love the notion that when Iris summons Helen to the ramparts. Mm -hmm. She stops weaving about the battles, and the battle stops, and everybody's sitting down waiting for the duel. I, I love the notion that she, as the poet, can actually stop the action by stopping weaving. Oh, that's great. I never thought of that. That's uh, the... We've discussed that a few times at R25. So yeah. my, uh, my question was about, you made the comment about Hecuba going and finding a robe mm -hmm. that was woven in uh, Sidon. Right. So what that reminded me of was where I grew up uh, in the Southwest, traditionally the local people are called, called Pueblos. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason why you traded with one another is because those other people had such beautiful pottery. Yes. And nobody ever tried to copy that. You had Your community had your pattern, your mm -hmm. tradition, you stuck with that. Is there any indication that in the Bronze Age communities had one style and they stuck to that and other communities had other styles? That's a very good question, and I don't know the answer, and I don't even know, I wouldn't even know how to get the answer. Although the fact that, that um, you know, it was identified as a, we a weaving from Sidon, or Sidon, um, is, um, it suggests that they, they were different. I mean, I do know in the high Andes, every community had its own particular pattern. And you could, look, you could see somebody from a distance and know where they were from by seeing the pattern. And a, a friend of mine who w learned to wear, weave on a backstrap loom asked her teacher, well, what do you, f since everybody in your town, especially, you know, your mother is weaving, your mother weaves and, and you weave, and it's, don't you wish that you could weave something that was just your own? And, she's, and this girl said, my weaving isn't anything like my mother's. How could you think that? <laughs> 
Um, so well, I mean, it's our it's our lack of context that it, we don't get it. That's right. That's right. Um, so so yes, there would I, I'm I'm guessing that there would be strong um, there there would be locally identified ways of weaving, and there would be um, um, it, it would always be individual. Um, and and um, and the if you look at the loom different looms on on um, on vase paintings, you can see that there are the looms themselves are different, the tools that the people are holding are different, and and weavers. I mean, I mean I weave with a group, I weave tapestry with a group of weavers, and and I have and I have friends who weave on, and I've done floor loom weaving, and people have their and go to workshops. Everybody has their own kind of special way of doing something. So if you didn't happen to see weavers from other places, um, you know, you you do the things the way your teacher does, the way you learn them, and and that would lead to different looks in the weaving, um, and and um, just like a different dialect, so to speak. Um, Amazing. Thank you. Yes, Thank do, you. Do we have any other questions uh, or comments from community members who are here? Let me see. Okay. If you um, if you like, I can. I don't know. I don't know if this will work, but I wanted to. I could hold up some of this um, Peruvian weaving. Yeah. Well, here's a good picture. See if this works. Yes. Can you see? You could see the details. Yes, you could see. The, it's, it looks like it's a weave, uh, a loom that's on the ground, where the two, uh, the tension is created by putting things in the ground, right? Um, or no? Or is no, that what you're No. To? Actually, you're right. The tension is is created by there are two stakes, uh -huh. but the 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 weft the. I don't know if you can hear me. If I can, the, I can uh, hear you. We can hear you. Yes. Okay. Anyway, the tension on the loom is created by a, a back. It's called a backstrap loom because there's, you know, here somebody might tie it to a tree or a bedpost. Um, in Peru, there aren't a lot of trees, so I guess they they put stakes in the ground or or they use rocks or something something that you can then lean back and create tension on the warp. But but it was the the, the color in the things that those people are wearing, and I'm going to get another uh, picture. Okay, he, here's a, a bag. Yes, yeah, so hold it up higher is all. Great. Wow, yes, you can see the colors. And how complex that is, right? Yes. And, um, and here's another one. Okay, this is very similar, but different. Yes, I see. Um, So uh, let me. Uh, I just. I want to look at my notes because I'm. I'm sure I've forgotten. Oh, I know. I know, I know what I. I wanted. To, the, the. There are a couple more um, pictures there. Can you, um, Sarah, bring up the next one? The which is a little pattern. It's called. It's the mezzan. Um, the mezzan pattern. And I wanted to talk about the age of weaving. I mean, weaving is extremely. It's, it's an extremely old um, craft. So. You can if you look carefully, you can see that this is a kind of um, this is a, a, a mammoth tusk um, um, bracelet and or, or bone. I can't remember. It's and, and the the it's from the from Ukraine. It was found in Ukraine, and it, it's from the Upper Paleolithic, so about twenty thousand years ago. Um, so. Somebody asked me if this could be woven, and or how else might this pattern have developed? It's such a complex pattern. And I um, now you could go to the next photograph. So I set about trying to weave it on a warp weighted loom at the request of this person who asked me. And I what I found was that not only is it very easy to weave, but as you can see at the at the top. There is um, a zigzag. It's a twill um, zigzag, and and this is a three. You to do to weave those that 
that pattern, you go over two and under one. And um, and uh, twill, if you just go across the warp, going over two and under one, or uh, or vice versa, you get a uh, twill like the twill in a pair of blue jeans, you know, a kind of diagonal weave. Well, if you reverse the order, you get this zigzag pattern. And then I found, if you just make a tiny little mistake, you start creating this um, this whorls, this hook pattern. And um, so anybody who set out to weave that zigzag pattern would just easily find this, this zigzag pattern, which means that the pattern that's incised on that um, on that bracelet was um, was created in imitation of a woven pattern. I mean, it's it's not it's wow. not guaranteed, it's not right. proved, but it's, it seems very likely that that. Um, and the mammoth tusks, by the way, were were um, part of a. Every, everything in this community was built out of mammoth parts. And so it was at the time that mammoths had, had gone extinct and were about to go extinct, there, was a, there were a lot of dead mammoths around. But the, um, if you cut a mammoth tusk, you get a pattern that's very similar to this. Wow. And did I have another, um, another yeah. drawing in that series? Uh, unfortunately, I don't think we have that. And I do see also that um, it's 12.05. Oh, I've been, I've been so, I know, I'm oh. so impressed in this. I wish we could go on. So, yeah, Susan, but, um, so here's what I'd like to suggest. Maybe we could continue the conversation on Hour 25 in the discussion forums. Could we do that? Did sure, let's do that. Question? Let's yeah. do that. Yeah, I um, wish, um, I the, wish, yeah. I'll, um, I'll just, can I, if I can say one, one oh, thing. Please. That yeah. the other things in this, um, it, with that mizzen pattern, were musical instruments. Wow. Um, <laughs> so it was another connection, a very ancient connection between weaving and preoccupation with woven motifs and, and, music. and music. So yeah. with that, um, let's um, yes. go offline and, okay, and we so can continue. Yes, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, we'll try and get all these uh, images in a way that we can share with the larger community. I'm so delighted uh, that we had this time to talk together. Thank you, everyone, for your comments and your questions. We really look forward to future conversations with you, Susan. It was a real delight. Thank you so, so for much. For me, too. Thank you all for being there. Thanks. Thank you.